My name is Zach Perlin. I'm at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. And the focus of my research and the presentation today, as you can see on the screen, is trying to understand the role of organized labor, worker power in general, in shaping the employment and earnings trajectories of workers who are in routine occupations. And I'll be testing some, uh, showing some results using the PSID, which is a source of panel data that follows individual workers in the U.S. over time through about a three-decade period. So the nice thing about a conference like this is that I don't need to spend much time on background, but I'll just say a couple words about this idea of routine bias technological change, or this idea that technological advancements generate declining demand for routine tasks. And we know from our conversation this morning, from plenty of prior research on this topic, that routine bias technological change can generate a couple types of consequences. The first relates to employment shares. So for these occupations that are more routine in nature, your manufacturers, your office clerks, and so forth, we've seen over the last few decades a decline in their employment shares relative to other types of occupations. Uh, again, we know from discussion this morning that these occupations tend to be in the middle of the wage and earnings distribution. So when their employment shares fall, if the employment shares of lower pay and higher pay jobs increase, we have what's called job polarization. Employment shares are one thing, but we could also look at occupational wages or even annual earnings. We know that there's a possibility that due to declining demand for routine tasks, that workers in these occupations will experience uh, perhaps declining relative wage growth over time. But what I, what I want to emphasize is that if you actually look across states in the U.S., if you look across other high-income countries, this is not a universal trend. And even in the U.S., you can read Larry Michelle's work on this, it's perhaps confined to one decade at a particular uh, point in time in this country. So what I'm going to focus on and, and the questions that I think we need more research on in general relate to what you see on the screen right here that so often when we assess the consequences of technological change, we do so from a very macro-level perspective, looking at changes in the aggregate to see how employment shares of certain types of occupations change over time, but perhaps not enough focus on the experiences of individual workers. Uh, a couple of exceptions that I'll talk about, but you can think about why this might be important. If you are in this routine job, you your job is made redundant due to technological change, what does it mean? To what types of occupations are you moving to? Are you more likely to live in, in poverty? Are you sent to unemployment? What is that experience like? And using panel data, we can try to answer some of those questions. And the reason we're here today is because there's a need for more research on the role of labor market institutions in shaping variance in earnings and employment uh, opportunities of these occupations at uh, greater risk of automation. Labor market institutions, a broad category, we could talk about you know, minimum wages, we could talk about a number of things, but I'm going to focus on worker power and the role of organized labor in the form of trade unions uh, in particular. I want to again highlight a couple of the advantages of using panel data to follow individual workers over time and what this might be able to add to our conversation. First, we can answer this question of where are the workers going? Is it true that if you're in a routine job, your job is made redundant, that you're more likely to move to a lower pay service sector type job? Or perhaps might you move to a higher paid job? Um, are you sent to unemployment? What does that process actually look like on average? How do, they, do these individuals fare when their job is made redundant? Again, are they stuck in unemployment? Are they more likely, likely to live in poverty? And then is this conditional on uh, certain policy choices that we make? And then we can also get at some of the mechanisms that uh, sit beneath these macro-level changes. So if we see a decline in the share of routine jobs, is this because there's accelerated layoffs of these individuals in the jobs, or is it just a slowdown in hiring that occurs over time? Using this individual-level data, we can start or do more, perhaps, to answer those questions. I mentioned there's a couple papers and probably more that are using panel data already to answer these types of questions. In the British case, uh, Thomas Kerr and Ina Gallego find that about 64% of British workers in routine jobs remain in that routine occupation five years later. Uh, a pretty small group is switching out. And in, in their study, they actually find very few are unemployed five years later. 
Interestingly, they find that most individuals who transition out of routine jobs are not moving to service sector lower paid jobs, but are in fact moving to higher pay or at least higher status jobs. And Matias Cortez uh, finds something similar, that high ability workers are more likely to switch out of routine jobs and tend to fare better over time if they do. What I'm going to add to this, hopefully, is a focus on labor market institutions, a focus on worker power and how that shapes the employment trajectories of these types of individuals. Why focus on organized labor? I think uh, many of you are probably familiar with this literature, but if not, there's plenty of evidence that greater union coverage or greater collective bargaining coverage in cross-national comparison is associated with lower levels of in-work poverty rates, more compressed wage distribution, more employment security for individuals in precarious jobs, higher wage premiums for workers in routine occupations. Uh, I've shown in work for the OECD that union membership is beneficial for the relative earnings growth of routine occupations. And we know that unionization is on the decline here in the U.S., but that is not a universal trend, particularly when we look at collective bargaining coverage and look at other high-income countries. Uh, and I can talk about that more later uh, if desired. So here are the precise questions that I'm going to try to answer over the next uh, half hour or so. First, I'm going to look at employment tenures and transitions of workers in routine occupations. So where do these, routine, these individuals in routine occupations, where do they go if they leave their routine job? Is it the case that unionized routine workers are more likely to maintain their jobs for a longer duration of time relative to non-unionized routine workers. In other words, can unionization help sort of slow that transition process into this labor market of the future? And then I'm going to look at are unionized routine workers less likely to become jobless in general relative to the non-unionized group? So then I'll switch to earnings. That's the employment focus. So we can look at earnings. Is it the case that unionized routine workers experience higher earnings while they're in their routine jobs? relative to non-unionized routine workers and relative to former routine work, individuals in routine occupations who have switched to other types of jobs. Okay? To answer these questions, I'm going to use microdata from what's called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, or the PSID. This is panel data that follows the same individuals over about a three-decade period, 18,000 individuals in the sample, I'm primarily focusing on outcomes from 1980 onward for data consistency purposes. And I'll be looking at adults between the ages of around 25 to 64. Uh, anyone who's worked on a routine occupation throughout their uh, career is included in the sample. Uh, and I'll be looking at uh, their transitions and earnings trajectories. We've talked a little bit about how we can categorize different occupations in the earlier presentations. And I'm going to use a very similar classification to what uh, Henry and others have used. It's, it's these three that you see here on the screen. So we have these non-routine cognitive occupations, which tend to be more of your managerial, professional-level occupations. In the middle, we have the routine occupations, again, your office clerks, customer service clerks, trade workers, manufacturing, et cetera. And at the very bottom, we have the non-routine manual group. It tends to be more service sector, uh, healthcare uh, type occupations. And on this side over here, I've just simply laid out an indicator of low earnings. This is if your earnings, uh, annual earnings, are below 50% of the national median. And you can see the share that has low earnings by group. It's exactly what you would expect. So among these non-routine cognitive jobs, only 6% with low earnings in, from 2013 to 2015. Among the routine occupations, about 14%. And among the non-routine manual, about 21%. So it's what you'd expect, and I'm going to use this benchmark of low earnings uh, throughout the rest of this presentation as well. So how am I going to answer those questions that I put to you before? Um, a couple different approaches. I'm going to try to do as much work as possible with just descriptive data. So looking at the different employment and earnings outcomes for adults who are unionized versus non-unionized at different intervals in, after they were first in that routine job. So, for example, I'll look two years after they were in that first entered the routine job, see how they're doing, four years later, six years later, eight years later, and ten years later. And at each time interval, try to get some assessment of the role of unionization and shaping the likelihood that they're still in a routine job, that they switch to another type of occupation, their earning status, and so on. Then I'll use uh, 
individual fixed effects models. So taking advantage of the fact that we have data on individual workers over time, we can try to weed out some of these between worker differences and take advantage of the fact that many individuals, when they start their routine jobs, are not unionized, but perhaps become unionized during that employment process. And if that's the case, do we see on average that, that contributes to different earnings and employment outcomes? And finally, uh, those who know the you know, union wage premium literature know that selection effects are always a massive challenge. I'm going to try to address for selection effects using propensity score weighting techniques, uh, but of course, it's not a perfect fix. But I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, you know, quickly, for those who prefer equations, this is very simple. Our outcome variable here is simply you know, the occupation type at 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 years later. I'll estimate these separately. So are you still in routine work? Are you in a non-routine cognitive job, non-routine manual, unemployed, low earnings? Controlling for things like age, sex, education, race, ethnicity, uh, year dummies, and state dummies. And when we move to the individual fixed effects model, it looks almost identical, but of course, adding these person-level fixed effects and treating unionization as a permanent treatment here. So in this model, if you became unionized at all during routine work, I you know, count you as a unionized individual and look at your employment and earnings outcomes even if later on you leave your job or, or leave your union. And again, I'll take some steps to try to account for selection effects based on observables. Uh, talk about this more in the paper, um, and I'll show you what happens when we do that, but recognizing that it's not a perfect uh, fix to selection problems. So if we get into the results, uh, first, just some very basic descriptive stuff. We're going to look at employment shares of all employed adults and union membership, as told by the PSID data, from 1981 to 2015. And so if you see the very top line there, the triangles, that's your non-routine cognitive jobs. You know, more of these professional and managerial type occupations. You can see a slight increase over time from around 50% to, say, 55% uh, in this sample. The line in the middle with the Xs, that's your routine occupations. And as we know, a slight decline over time, not massive, but from about 40% uh, closer to 30% from 1980 to 2015. Union membership is the very light-colored line, third from the top. Um, again, consistent with what we already know from past work, there's a decline in union membership. It does show up here in the PSID sample from about 25% to closer to 15%. And the very bottom line are these non-routine manual occupations, uh, more of the service sector type jobs. And again, you see a rise in their employment shares over time. So consistent with what we know from past work. But now let's get to the more exciting stuff. What happens to the individuals who are in routine jobs? We'll start with 10 years later. Where do they end up? And does this vary based on whether they were unionized while in routine work during those 10 years, at least one of the 10 years, versus not? And so the line I want to highlight first is this dark gray line that sticks out for both groups. This is the unconditional mean, so not controlling for age, sex, education, anything yet. But this is the share that is still in a routine occupation 10 years later. And for this unionized group, it's about 72% on average. Fairly high. For the non-unionized group, you can see it's about 46%. Now, there's a lot of things that could be explaining this. We'll get into that. But if you just look at the unconditional means, you see there is some difference between the group that was unionized versus not. If you look at the first bar, it's the black bar here. This is non-routine cognitive jobs. Again, these more professional and managerial type occupations. For the unionized group, only about 15% of this group was in a non-routine cognitive job 10 years later. In contrast, the non-unionized group, about 30%. So of that non-unionized population, most of them, the largest chunk of them, if they're transitioning jobs, they are moving to what are generally higher pay type occupations. But that's also true for the unionized group. In fact, this bar here, the third one, is the non-routine manual. This is more of your service sector type occupations. No difference between the two groups, about 5% each. And the last bar, it's hard to see on the screen, uh, but this is unemployment. And what you see, this says 9% over here for the unionized group, 20% for the non-unionized group. So for individuals who were unionized during their spell of routine employment, 10 years later, uh, only about half as likely to be jobless compared to the non-unionized group. Uh, this 
It includes data that spans you know, 1980 to 2015. So you might be wondering, well, you know, is this all about the 1980s or the 1990s? Does this still apply? So I'm not going to focus much on this slide, but what I want to show you is that in the paper, I do segment this by decade. And across decades, you see somewhat similar pattern, that the unionized group uh, tends to stay in their routine jobs longer relative to the non-unionized group, less likely to be unemployed 10 years later, regardless of which decade you're looking at. So what happens when we start to bring some controls into the model? Now we add age, education, sex, race, ethnicity, year of observation, state of residence. And we can look at the conditional effect now of union membership on the likelihood of employment and earnings outcomes at two, four, six, eight, and 10 years after they first entered that routine job. Okay, so on the x-axis for each of these, you have two, four, six, eight, and 10. That's years after they were first observed in that routine occupation. So if we narrow in on the upper middle panel, this is the conditional effect of unionization on the likelihood of remaining in a routine job at these different time intervals. And you can see it's positive and statistically significant, suggesting that union membership, again, is associated with a greater likelihood of remaining in these routine jobs, similar to what I've shown you before. And this is consistent at 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 years afterwards. At 10 years, it's about a 15 percentage point increase in the likelihood that you're still in that job relative to the non-unionized group. So where are these other individuals going again? This is what we saw before. Union membership is associated with a decreased likelihood of tr transitioning into a non-routine cognitive job, uh, which again are more of your professional and managerial type occupations. That's shown here, consistent with what I showed you in the last slide. What I find interesting are these bottom two uh, indicators, unemployment and low earnings. So union membership, union membership is associated consistently with a decreased likelihood of being jobless two years later, four years later, six years later, up to 10 years later, about a five percentage point decrease in the likelihood of being jobless. And if we look at low earnings, again, this is consistently negative, indicating that union membership decreases the likelihood that you are going to have annual earnings that are below 50% of the median. And this only includes employed adults. The unemployed are not included in this calculation. I want to show you some more just descriptive statistics on uh, the demographics of these occupation types 10 years after they were first in these routine jobs. And this highlighted group here is the routine unionized group, and we're going to compare some characteristics of them to these other types of uh, groups. Starting with just overall occup uh, occupation shares, employment shares, you can see that the U routine unionized group is pretty small. It's about 11%. Um, we know that this group is traditionally smaller. Individuals in this group are more likely to hang on to their jobs over time, but as a whole, they're about 11% uh, on average 10 years after first entry into routine work. This column, it might be hard to read, it's cut off, but it's the share with low earnings, or earnings below 50% of the median. And what stands out to me is for the unionized routine group, it's only about 3% of those individuals who have low earnings 10 years later, and that's lower than any other occupation category on here. So if you look at Non-unionized routine, it's about 11%. Even if you go up to the non-routine cognitive jobs, you can split them out into their sub-occupations, 3%, 7%, 5%, all higher than this unionized routine group. And, of course, you know these more service sector type jobs at the bottom, about 20% uh, for individuals who moved into, two, into these occupations are experienced low earnings. Not much difference in terms of the age of these routine unionized workers. But there are some differences in education levels. And in particular, what this shows is that this group is much less likely to have a college degree, much more likely to only have a high school degree. So when we think about pathways to the middle class for individuals without a college degree, this is more evidence of decades worth of evidence that union membership might be important, particularly combined with what are, at least used to be these middle pay type occupations. Uh, what happens when we look at uh, percent male and percent white, or percent female? You can see this also happens to be a very male group. About two-thirds of this group is men, only one-third uh, women, and a bit more uh, racially diverse than the uh, non-routine cognitive occupations, 
uh, but comparable to the non-routine manual group. So do these findings hold when we move to the individual fixed effects models? So now, again, we're looking at within-person changes over time. Uh, on average, if you've started routine work uh, non-unionized, but you flip to unionization, does this have some effect on uh, your outcomes? And the short answer is yes. Everything I'm going to show you here is consistent with what I've shown you in the prior slides. So the effect of union membership on the likelihood of remaining in routine work for the 20 years after you're first in that routine job, it's about an 18 percentage point increase relative to the uh, not being unionized. Decreased likelihood that you move to a non-routine cognitive job. Again, exactly what I've shown you before. Decreased likelihood of experience, uh, experiencing unemployment during the 20 years after you were first in that routine job, about a 5 percentage point reduction, and a reduction in the likelihood that uh, you experience low earnings. If we try to account for selection into unionization, maybe these people who you know, become unionized have certain characteristics that just fundamentally make them different than the non-unionized group. That could be driving our outcomes. So one way to try to get around this is using propensity score reweighting re techniques. Uh, in the paper, I don't show it here, you can see that this does a pretty effective job of achieving balance between the comparison and the tr treatment group at baseline, uh, but it's not perfect. But what happens when we try to account for selection? Well, you see the point estimates drop a little bit uh, by about one-fourth, but still fairly large and significant. So now instead of a 18 uh, percentage point increase, union membership is associated with a 13 percentage point increase in the likelihood of staying in that routine job uh, for a longer duration of time. And similar stuff, unemployment and, and low earnings still at about 5 and 4 percentage point reductions, respectively. Uh, in the paper, I break this up by decade. I break it up by race, ethnic, ethnicity, education levels, etc. I'm not going to uh, spend time talking about those results, but what you generally see is that the patterns are consistent uh, across time, across education group, uh, race, ethnicity, and uh, sex as well. Um, that's discussed more in the paper if you're interested. And there's another way to visualize some of this, just using an event study specification type framework. Here, looking at the effect of union membership uh, during routine work on employment and earnings relative to all other adults in routine work. This red line here at zero is the point of unionization. So before, you can see that the treatment group didn't have you know, different likelihood of having low earnings or to be unemployed. But after unionization, you see some pretty clear negative effects consistent with everything I've showed you in the uh, prior slides. So some conclusions, some takeaways uh, from this work. Uh, first, I, I find it interesting that individuals in routine occupations who leave their routine jobs typically are moving to non-routine cognitive jobs, not necessarily these non-routine manual jobs. In other words, they're often moving towards these sort of light professional or light managerial type occupations rather than lower paid service sector jobs, which is perhaps a positive outcome because those occupations in the non-routine cognitive world tend to pay better than the routine jobs and the, especially the non-routine manual jobs. Very few are moving downwards to service sector jobs. The only reason I say downward is because they tend to be lower pay, and this is consistent with some uh, prior work as well. The second point here, we see evidence that routine individuals in routine jobs who are unionized tend to remain in their routine occupations for a longer duration of time. So it seems that unions have some mitigation effect on the pace of employment transitions when t new technologies are introduced. This unionized group tends to earn higher wages relative to the non-unionized group, and they tend to be less likely to have low earnings or uh, earnings that are below 50% of the annual median. And this third point sort of summarizes it, that organized labor seems to play a pretty important role in shaping the pace and consequences of technological change. And I want to emphasize this point for a moment because I think so often when we talk about automation or technological change or globalization, we perceive it as these large, scary, exogenous, inevitable forces that are 
going to inflict some type of pain on certain members of society and that there's nothing we can do about it. But what I want to emphasize is this, that that's not necessarily the case. Worker power is one example, as I've tried to show here. Uh, but also we can talk about welfare state institutions. We can point to other countries that perhaps do a better job of making sure when you lose your job, you still have some basic level of subsistence until you get back on track. And all of these are policy choices. So to summarize, I think there's a role for policy. I think there's a role for politics. And I think there is a role for worker power when we talk about the social consequences of technological change. Now, uh, we don't have some magic pill or magic wand to you know, revive unions across the US. Uh, that's going to be a pretty tough job. But what we know is that union membership is not the only strategy for enhancing worker power. There's other strategies that exist. We could talk about sectoral level bargaining, as exists in many other high-income countries. We could talk about antitrust enforcement. We could talk about worker representation, wage boards. And Gabriel was talking about this earlier in his uh, Germany example. There are other countries that have been more successful in enhancing worker power, institutionalizing that. And not surprisingly, we see different uh, types of outcomes in those countries. So all of these are within the realm of possible. And finally, my last slide here, there's still some things that are unclear or that need more work. Um, so it's not clear, at least in what I presented, if organized labor is slowing down the introductions of new technologies, and that's why they're more resistant, or is it they are welcoming these new technologies, but they're managing the introduction in a way that avoids layoffs and labor substitution? What are the actual mechanisms behind this relationship? Um, I think that's not clear in my paper, and, and more work needs to be done on that. And moving forward, of course, there's plenty of work that can be done in this paper, and I welcome ideas on how to strengthen identification uh, to make a more convincing case for the causal effect of union membership, or at least to test it. Uh, more attention to heterogeneous effects by race, ethnicity, gender, and so forth. Uh, and I welcome any other ideas on how to improve upon this work. So thank you all. Should I sit here? Does, does that work? You can hear me? OK. I need to have my hands available for the presentation. So, um, OK, so um, thanks to Marcus for the opportunity to, um, to read this paper and to, um, to Zach for writing it. Um, so I'm just going to start, um, having seen the discussion this morning, I'm glad I, that I made this figure. Um, so just to remind us what's been going on with um, union membership in the United States, probably many of us know this, but it's been declining a lot um, and uh, by about half since 1983. And actually, this is a like continuation of a longer term trend since about, uh, it looks like about 1950. Um, but particularly the private sector unionization is really very low. Um, so a little bit more workers would be sort of covered by a sectoral bargaining agreement, but uh, or by a, a collective bargaining agreement, but you know we uh, uh, unions have really um, declined um, over the years. Um, so let me talk now about what uh, what this paper is doing. Um, so he's focusing on the experience of workers in uh, routine occupations that uh, you know sort of have identi been identified as uh, particularly likely to disappear with um, with automation. And really, he's asking using the, the, the data from the PSID, which follows workers over time, so this nice um, data work to ask what are the trajectories of union and non-union workers in uh, these routine occupations. And so basically, he's asking what are these workers doing two, four, six, ten years after entering um, a routine occupation. And you know, this is with the background of asking whether unions might uh, slow the pace of displacement in these automation-prone um, occupations. So Zach did a really nice job of summarizing the findings in a, in a clear way. So I won't spend um, a lot of 
of time on this, but just to recap, uh, union workers are um, more likely to remain in routine occupations um, over time. They're less likely to be in non-routine cognitive op occupations. They're less likely to be non-employed, and they're less likely to have below median income. So this raises sort of the question of whether these are better outcomes or, or, or worse outcomes. So, you know, transitioning to a, um, a, a, a non-routine cognitive op occupation, like we might generally consider that to be a good outcome. So that's, you know, maybe um, moving into a professional occupation or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, and staying in a routine occupation is stable, but maybe that's, you know, not a great tra trajectory. Um, but I think it's, it's pretty clear that having low income is, um, is bad. And, you know, being unemployed in the sense of trying to find a job and you can't find one is a bad outcome. Um, but being non-employed, um, you know, potentially being out of the labor force uh, is, is less clear whether that's a bad outcome. Um, you know, I think uh, we can cover the sins of economists and, you know, one uh, is ignoring the value of things that people do when they're not working. Um, and, you know, we can make a judgment about video games um, and raising children, but uh, they, they perhaps have, um, have some value. So, uh, so I think that the version I read, um, it, it, the, it, it's not clear whether the effect on low income, uh, low income is driven by non-employment or not, because if you're not employed, if you have, you have low wages. So just to sort that out a little bit, that, could, um, that might uh, shed some light on, on that. But I think you know, this paper presents a lot of findings consistent with you know, what we've seen in, in other work, that union jobs you know, are good jobs. They're more stable, um, and, and they're higher paying. And so you know, this, is, this is consistent with that. And I think you know, it would be worth kind of getting at this non-employment angle, and I'm going to return to this um, in a minute, but I think that that is a, a, a clear finding of the work. Um, so a few uh, caveats about the paper and, um, and potential extensions or, or, or uh, areas where he could emphasize more. Um, so, you know, in, in, in doing this type of work and trying to understand what's the effect of being in a union on these various outcomes, we're going to worry about whether there are difference between union and non-union workers. And I take the point earlier um, that maybe we shouldn't call this skill, but there could be differences in these workers and you know, sort of their, um, the tasks that they're doing and whether uh, those are, uh, let's say, well remunerated by the market. Um, and you know, he's controlling for age, education, uh, sex, race, state, and year. And so education would be sort of your main um, doing the main work of kind of thinking about this selection on, um, on what tasks or skills uh, pe uh, tasks people are doing or skills they have. That might be pretty blunt in this context. Um, so I think he could um, potentially include some other controls related to um, the, the occupations that people are doing in uh, unionized and non-unionized. Um, and also sort of related to this, and um, to the, the, the possibility that unionized and non-unionized workers are doing different things or have, uh, have different skills they're bringing to the labor market, um, and also to non-participation. I think it would be really nice to, um, to divide the analysis by gender and, um, and not just control for gender. One, because, and primarily because I think it is really important, this has come up a few times this morning, uh, that women and men, women's experiences and men's experiences in the labor market are very different. Their trajectories are very different. And I'm not sure it sort of can be handled by a gender control as opposed to doing a separate analysis. So I think we'll get a more reliable kind of picture if we do that. Um, but I also think it's just very interesting because we know that men and women um, are doing, uh, doing different work and have different patterns of, of labor force um, participation. So um, this is just one way of seeing that. So I'll admit that I, um, I uh, didn't want to deal with the occupation <laughs> codes. Um, but you can kind of get an idea that um, men and women who are 
uh, in private sector unions are doing really different work. Um, so, and also, I, I don't have it here, but uh, the unionization rate for women is also quite a bit lower, um, and it's lower conditional on industry. So there, there are you know a lot of differences by gender. So the um, so these are the industries, the the top industries that um, men and women union workers are in, and so you can see that. Oh, I can't point, but the um, uh, the the biggest group for women is professional services, and like half of that is hospitals. Um, and then for men, you have manufacturing, uh, transportation, communication, public utilities, and construction. So I think just and you know having heard the discussion this morning, I think. We, we think about this as a male thing, um, and the, you know, we're thinking about manufacturing and these kinds of things, and it's important, not just for this paper, but in general, to be really um, looking at the gender, um, the gender differences, and then the, um, the labor force participation patterns are also going to differ a lot, and so I worry a little bit that that could be um, playing into the findings he has looking at um, non-employment. Um, okay, so... Uh, thoughts on um, uh, overall in the paper. So I, I think, um, you know, the question is, uh, will unions slow displacement in the face of um, automation? It seems like maybe a little bit, at least, you know, at the level of the individual workers, they're, they're, um, those jobs are more stable, they're less likely to get um, displaced. And so then we need to kind of think about, well, what are the costs and benefits of, of that? Like, is that a good thing? Um, and, you know, normally one of the things we think about when we think about unions is, well, maybe they raise uh, wages of incumbent workers at the expense of uh, potential new entrants. Now, in this case, that's a little bit less of a concern because if you have uh, an occupation or an industry that um, where labor demand is declining because of automation, then, you know, maybe this is a way that we kind of protect the incumbent workers' transition um, but we don't really care so much that new workers aren't coming into that, um, you know, to that occupation or, or, or that industry because it's kind of, you know, over time being, um, uh, being displaced by, by uh, automation. Um, and I think, you know, a really important thing to think about for this paper and in general is this question of, you know, do we want to be... Uh, preventing displacement, or do we want to be helping displaced workers? And, um, you know, again, while we're uh, doing economist mea culpas, um, I think, you know, as a discipline, we have focused a lot on this idea that, well, let's let um, the creative destruction happen, and technological change will happen, and uh, we shouldn't interfere with that process, and then let's have policies that sort of um, deal with the consequences and uh, you know, provide income support for student uh, for for I'm, I'm an education economist, so um, not students for workers um, who um, who sort of lose out in that process. And I think you know one of the things we're learning that you know maybe lots of other people um, already knew is that the cost of displacement sort of go beyond um, uh, beyond the 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 income loss, and um, you know so maybe that argues for um, uh, in favor of sort of supporting approaches that would actually delay displacement as opposed to um, to just dealing with the consequences of that. Now, I, I think, though, you know, these aren't mutually exclusive, and, you know, my view is we need to be doing a lot more to deal with the consequences because, you know, it's happening and there's always displacement that happens um, in the economy. Um, so uh, the, the, the question, which I think you got at at the end, is... Like, well, what role can unions um, have in, in, you know, sort of dealing with, uh, audit, with the consequences of automation? And, you know, at first I was like, well, you know, unions, what, we don't even really hardly have them anymore. So the role, the, it can't be, you know, it can't be a huge role. Um, but I think, you know, I guess it just depends on whether you think that that trend can be reversed, um, which, you know, I don't really have. It seems difficult, um, but I think that would also be very good for a number of other reasons. Um, and, you know, the fact that the rate is so low suggests that if you were able to bring it back up, you know, maybe there would be um, some benefits there. And I think those, those do actually go beyond the effects on uh, 
uh, displacement in the face of automation, but there's a broader set of potential benefits for middle and working classes that would be associated with that. And I had, um, I had another point that I thought I wouldn't have time for, but, uh, but listen, hearing the earlier discussion, and I have three minutes, um, I think another um, thing this, the, the, the paper raises and, and, and uh, Zach's presentation really brought up is we should really be thinking about uh, institutions more broadly. So, you know, this paper is looking at union membership. And I think um, in the paper you could, you say, but you could do an even clearer job of saying it's like, well, we don't, we don't know that these are the effects of union membership per se, but there may be other institutions around uh, or sort of other things related to union membership that matter. And then just in the policy discussion, we can think about these other kinds of, um, you know, in labor market institutional um, features like minimum wage and sectoral bargaining and kind of other things that, um, that might um, have similar types of, um, of effects as, as union um, membership per se. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, <laughs> So we're going to take some questions, and, um, but I first want to get my question in. Actually, Sarah's last point uh, was actually my first question for you, is the idea of what does unionization really represent? It represents some set of institutions, and so can we think of different ways in a world where unionization itself is seen as kind of, in many respects, passe in some quarters, you know, can we replicate? some of the really nice features of unionization if we think institutions matter for some of these things. So um, that's my first question. And um, I'm going to go around the room, take about two or three questions, come back to Zach and Sarah. And then um, I think we'll have enough time for a couple of rounds here. So you first, sir, and then. I think I'd like to elaborate perhaps on your question a bit further. It, it, it's a way to segment unions between those unions who are essentially, uh, you know, negotiating wage pensions and maybe those which are engineering or craft-based and are actually asking for skills upgrades of their workers, which I think Germany does. Uh, I go back to Adam Smith, who actually said that lifelong education was more important for the factory worker so that, the, so that life was spent not just doing menial things the whole time. And, you, you know, at the end of the day, there's so much work to be done to develop communities, uh, to develop families, all the things that economists don't sometimes count. But... Uh, Otherwise, it's self-fulfilling because if all if all the unions are only just negotiating wages and pensions, then we're not, uh, you, you know, being able to look at uh, the second type, which is m maybe what is needed. Right. Okay, Jim. And then Lisa, and then Richard. Yeah, yeah Jim. So uh, this is a comment rather than a question, and it probably applies to the previous discussion also. I th we need to be a little bit careful about identifying changes in jobs for routine workers with automation, that there are other things that affect those jobs. For instance, people bring up the secretaries being, secretaries and typists being automated away. If you look at technical studies, automation only reduces the amount of retyping that takes place by about 20 percent. It doesn't explain what happened. What really happened was a shift of job, of work from typists to managers and professionals. Similarly, the travel agent wasn't automated away. It was a shift of work to the consumer. So, um, the, you know, when, when we think about unions or when we think about uh, macroeconomic policies, we, we need to think about the other things that are going on and affecting routine workers aside from just technology. Uh, Henry Hetker, I, I'm retired government, and I wondered uh, what your feelings were on the closure of the Lordstown, Ohio GM plant. Uh, I had contacted a senator from my state in Virginia in the hopes that it could be continued to remain open and to redesign the Impala and the crews into electric vehicles or into hybrid vehicles that would permit the thing to stay open because of the new type of vehicle. Uh, somehow I think there's a lack of imagination on the part of a lot of management in these top companies uh, in as far as job redesign, product redesign, uh, 
as opposed to simply introducing automation as a way of redesigning a plant. Uh, they are going to build electric vehicles there now, but it will be another company uh, as electric uh, pickup trucks. So it's not a total disaster, but for the unions of GM that were working there, it is quite a disaster, something that probably could have been prevented if people had stepped in and tried to you know, take up the bat and, and try to turn things around. A, a clarification before a question, because the question will be redundant if I misunderstood this, Zach. But um, I think your estimates show that not only is being a union member associated with a lower chance of becoming non-employed, but also a lower chance of moving into a non-routine cognitive occupation, if I read That's the right. yep. chart correctly. So if I, using the terms loosely, downward and upward mobility, right, with all the caveats that apply to that, suggests that unions reduce the risk of downward mobility but also reduce the chances of upward mobility. It's not clear on its face that that's necessarily a win. Uh, it may well be that more flexibility and more dynamism uh, is, a, is, quotes, forcing uh, more people to move on and therefore up rather than remaining in place. You know, the assumption that stasis is good um, rather depends on the counterfactual. So just love your commentary on uh, the lack of, quotes, upward mobility that you also find among union members. Yeah, actually, just a direct reaction to that. I think that's in part also a problem of the unions in the U.S. of having a sort of very keeping a status quo and not really looking forward. But that's that's besides the point. Um, I had uh, I had one sorry I had a one question and um, one comment and maybe a suggestion for um, for an inclusion in your research. So one thing um, that I noticed was uh, you broke it down into different decades and I was wondering whether the data that you were using also permitted a breakdown according to different sectors and more than just a decade because what I think would be interesting is to see how um, the uh, jobs um, developed uh, through different sectors, specifically the uh, the service industry versus the manufacturing industry, and in particular the effects during the crisis of 2007-2008. Because what would be interesting, and I'm not sure if it's possible, but what some um, data, for example, from the um, Metropolitan, Statistical, uh, uh, Metropolitan Statistical Analysis data from the census suggests is that manufacturing industries have been a lot more stable uh, in terms of employment and in terms of um, incomes incomes, excuse me, um, over the years of the crisis. So that would be interesting. I'm not sure if that's possible. But um, overall, I think the research that you presented is really interesting. I think, in fact, we should um, turn it into the AFL-CIO. They could use some evidence-based um, research. Um, but I think um, if I were to play devil's advocate here and put take the position of a, um, of a company, I would say, well, that's really interesting and that's great. But, you know, unions have a negative effect on companies, right? That's what they will claim always. So I think what would be an interesting addition to your research to omit that would be, and, and I'm not sure, this is just a suggestion out of the blue, I'm not, po I'm not sure if it's possible with data, maybe not with that data set that you're using, but maybe it's possible with different data sets, to see whether the unionization actually has an effect on companies and on their economic development. Because if it doesn't, then there really isn't any reason why unions could be or should be bashed in the U.S. if they, in fact, have a positive effect on workers, on purchasing power long term, and on um, basically a, a stronger middle class. To see if this robot works. So my name is Carl Polzer, and um, we're supposed to identify ourselves. I have a small project called the Center on Capital and Social Equity, study inequality, advocate for the bottom half, don't care too much about the top 1%. So my question is kind of a follow-on to Richard's. So I, I understand the time frame of your study is 10 years. So what if you looked a little further, and this, this has to do with the, the paradox of, yeah, well, here's the idea. Maybe, maybe the short-term benefits of union membership you know, pay off in 10 years and keep people in unions. But if, if non-union members have more an incentive to retrain, so are there, if you look out further, you know, so they, they might be doing better off over time, you know, because they, they got a professional job or they, they were forced, 
out of a defunct profession. Like my, my grandfather's Austrian, not Schumpeter. He was a typesetter, and he was a refugee, refugee during World War II. So I've, I've seen his union booklets. Uh, if he had really, he died before computers came in, but if he had been a typesetter in the 70s, he might have kept being a typesetter if he was a young man. And then the computers came in and wiped out the whole back shop of newspapers. So if he had had an incentive to change and, you know, he was very intelligent, he could have, anyhow, blah, blah, blah. But that's the kind of thing, it does it, if you look further into the future, you, you know, f you might see the non-union members doing better because they had to adapt. Or just an idea to, to research. Okay, so um, we have uh, comments on uh, institutions, you know, whether we should be not just focused, unions shouldn't be focused on just wages and pensions. Um, we have uh, uh, comments on management and how management can potentially mitigate some of the harms associated with, uh, with plant closures. Uh, Richard's question on upper mobility and questions. If, I, I guess the way I take that question is that uh, you know, unions uh, compress the wage distribution <laughs> and, and also mobility from the way we typically measure it and is that necessarily a win? And that actually plays into this gentleman's uh, question about dynamism. And, uh, and then Yasmin's question about uh, sectors, right? Sectoral differences. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and you can address our comment as well. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, a lot of questions. I'll try to get to all of them, or at least the ones that I'm capable of answering. Start with the first question. Uh, can we replicate the role of unions through other mechanisms? We know that we're not probably not going to see some great turnaround in union membership anytime soon, but can we sort of replicate their effect in other ways? And the short answer is yes, because many other countries are doing that right now. And I'll point to some examples. Uh, you look at a country like France, uh, very low levels of unionization there, but high levels of collective bargaining coverage. Many other countries in Europe have the exact same features. If we were to move towards some system of sectoral level bargaining, then it's not union membership that matters per se, but the fact that the extensions of these union agreements reach everyone who's working in this particular sector in partic this particular geographic area. And that's another way to extend uh, what unions provide for workers who are covered, that sense of worker power and some decent, uh, some general standards for labor protections and the earnings distribution. Uh, a question, uh, I'll go to Richard's question about upward mobility. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Can I, uh, is that because you think it's politically, I mean, I, it seems to me a political issue, both of these, right? So like you think it's politically easier to get the kind of policy that extends, you know, coverage to a broader set of workers than it is to revive unions? Yeah, I think so. That's part of it. It's politically easier and from a collective organization perspective, it's a little bit easier as well. So unionization in this country and the efforts to revive it are difficult for a number of reasons. We have firms that are very hostile towards uh, collections of workers who try to organize. EPA had a, EPI had a statistic uh, yesterday uh, in, in a new report showing that employers are charged with violating federal labor law in about 42% of all union drives. I mean, firms are very hostile to, to efforts to unionize in this country, and I don't know how we're going to overcome that uh, other than through some large policy changes like a move towards sectoral bargaining is my general sense around it, but you know, I'm open to counter perspectives. Uh, to the idea that unions sort of promote this stasis, they don't allow for individuals, or what we see in the data is that if you're unionized, you're less likely to move into one of these like, professional managerial type occupations. But what, what I would emphasize is that when we look at the share of, of workers who have low earnings within this unionized group, it's actually lower than individuals who moved into those other occupations. Now, if you look at mean incomes, uh, maybe it's a different story. People in these professional jobs might earn more. Um, but for those of us who are perhaps more concerned with life in the bottom half of distribution, just ensuring that they have some decent earnings in place, you see that unionized group uh, does pretty well, in fact, better than all the other occupation types 10 years later. So, you know, from a sort of occupational status perspective, perhaps, yes, you know, it's limiting upward mobility. But from a financial well-being perspective, uh, I think this group is doing okay. Uh, 
yes, Jim's point about, you know, is this really automation and what other factors are at play, I think is really well taken. Um, you know, one other example, I mean, his point was right on, but another example I could throw in, is this due to automation or globalization or how do we really distinguish all these macro factors that are playing in? I, I don't in this paper, um, except, you know, looking at routine occupations as those that are most vulnerable to automation, but there's a million other things going on. And I think the point is uh, very right. Uh, breaking out into sectors or industries, I think it's a really good idea. Um, one challenge in this particular data set is that there aren't uh, very good industry codes, uh, sector level codes that we can use. And other sources of data, the CPS, et cetera, those are there and we could test some of these ideas in a different way, but just not in the PSID, which I'm using in this particular study. I also think the idea of narrowing in on the recessions um, and seeing what happens during those time periods is particularly important. I know Henry and others have done work on this and find that it does matter when you uh, look at those particular time periods. Uh, I have no smart thoughts on whether GM should have closed its plant, et cetera. All I will say about GM right now is that um, you know, we saw a you know, brief return in workers exercising their ability to strike, and that was uh, something quite interesting. If you look at trends and strikes in this country, I know that from the 80s onwards, it's been incredibly low. Uh, but again, we can look cross-nationally and see the power of organized labor coming together and expressing their concern. If you look to Finland in the last two weeks, if you look to France uh, right now, regardless of whether you agree with their perspectives, you have to admit they're pretty successful at letting their displeasure be known. Uh, strikes are important. Um, negative effects on companies. Agree, it's really important to test. I can't do it in this data and dynamics, longer term effects, a really important point, and I'll give that more thought uh, in the future. Sir, you have anything to add or comment on? I think that you covered it really well. I'll just add one thing to the, the question of, um, you know, this movement into um, non-routine cognitive skills. Like, I think, you know, one question that's hard to get at here is what's the value of the stability? Um, you know, so obviously, you know, mobility, upward mobility might be good, but then, you know, these jobs may be less, less, less stable or, um, so I think, you know, we're seeing, part of what we're seeing here is that the, um, the union jobs are more stable, but I think maybe you could look at that more directly. Like, I don't know if the PSID has job tenure, so you could see whether people are staying in the, in the same jobs. Um, I, I think that there, there could be, um, there could be selection happening um, that that explains that finding. So I would en I would encourage like pushing on, on a little bit more um, to to make sure that it's not just that kind of people who enter non routine unionized jobs. Those are just like different jobs with different paths than the union ones. I mean, to a certain extent, if that's true and they really have the same skill content um, that's you know getting at what you're getting at but I think you know unpacking that a little bit and you know one of the most striking things is in the paper is from the individual fixed effects analysis where um, you see when people transition into um, unionized status which you know, which he, he refers to as joining a union but I, it could be and I suspect often is associated with a job change and he, we had a conversation offline that it the ability to under, to see what that change, to see inside that job change might be limited in the PSID, but I think, um, you know, to the extent you can say something about that and maybe in other data, like understanding what those transitions look like might shed light on, um, you know, sort of where some of these effects are, are coming from. Because there's this, this huge immediate decline in um, the probability of becoming unemployed when people transition into, uh, unionized, you know, become unionized, but that could be changing jobs. And so I think it's, it's just, it's, it's very uh, big and it's very immediate. Um, so I think it's, to unpack that a little more might shed some light on that. Once again, Sarah anticipated my next question. <laughs> so I wanted you to talk about uh, that, that, that issue and she kind of laid it out, this issue of treating, you, you know, joining a union as an absorbing state, right? And I'm really worried about the idea, because there could be job changes, there could be law changes, right, in the uh, geography wherever they live. And so part of the reason why you might get variation in union membership is just because of sort of environmental changes or job changes 
not necessarily something about their act of choice. And so I, I wanted you to push on that a little bit more. So any additional questions? And if you want to know whether unions have an adverse effect on uh, employment or firms, then there is a lot of research on that. You want to look into it. And I would suggest that maybe you contact Bill Spriggs, the chief economist at the AFL-CIO, who recently was the chair of the economics department at Howard University, and he'd be glad to provide you with that. Alternatively, if you come from Germany, you might look at the evidence on code determination, and I think all the evidence on code determination is that there's a very positive impact on firms. So I think your condescension is very misplaced. I don't know if you caught that I said I was devil's advocate in this case. Oh, sorry, but, but so I wasn't actually suggesting this. <laughs> yes, sir. There you go. I'm surprised right to work states haven't played into this conversation yet. I mean, it's it's a big deal, right? I mean, if sometimes you just don't have the opportunity to join a union because they're not promoted. That's essentially what I was getting at oh, okay. about the question about the environment changing. Yeah, right. Not necessarily choice changes. Martin, did you have a question? Yes. I had a follow-up example I, I wanted to clarify what concerns me. Uh, so uh, the education group of Brookings, one of the cases they were presenting a couple of months ago was on Bangladesh women's uh, garment workers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know Bangladesh, that is actually their main export sector and it's the main sort of up value thing for the whole of girl empowerment. But right now, the problem seems to be that the textile industry is going through a lot of technological change. So if all you did was try and protect the current workers' wages as opposed to upgrade their skills and give them more training, you will actually bankrupt the nation and bankrupt the uh, women's empowerment in Bangladesh. So you have to be careful in terms of you know, only arguing for, for protecting uh, the wages. I am not clear that what is happening in France is actually going to be good for France, but then uh, I don't know. But the case of Bangladesh, I do know what is desperately needed is more training so that they can stay in the smart part of the textile sector. And, and that's why I'm concerned for the second type of union, which actually requires the training to advance the, the worker into the new kind of sector. So any last questions? Okay, well, th thank you, Zach and Sarah, for great discussion, great paper. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.